Welcome to The Top Out, the show where we talk with entrepreneurs and investors about how they got started, the companies they run, and how they see the future. Brought to you by Redpoint Solutions. Today's episode is with Kwame Spearman. Kwame is the co-owner and CEO of The Tattered Cover in Denver, Colorado. Hey guys, so we're here with Kwame Spearman. Uh, Kwame is the co-owner and CEO of The Tattered Cover. Um, a little bit of background, if people don't know what The Tattered Cover is here in Denver, it's kind of an institution. It's an independent bookstore that's been open for over 50 years with a handful of locations. Um, if you live in Denver and somehow have not been to The Tattered Cover, I recommend that you do that. Um, so yeah, Kwame, good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Um, so I wanted to start with a little bit of your background, because um, I know you grew up in Denver. And I wanted to ask, like, did you hang out at The Tattered Cover when you were growing up? Or what, what role did bookstores and like literature in general um, play for you when you were growing up? Sure, I'll, I'll answer that backwards. So my mom was a public school teacher and principal when I was growing up. And so I, I really had the benefit that literature was at the forefront of my upbringing. And I, I was always comfortable and always immersed with books. And so I'd say I'd split time, honestly, between the Denver Public Libraries, which are absolutely fantastic, and the Tattered Cover. Um, the, the Tattered Cover would be almost like a reward. Like when you got that great report card, parents wanted to take you to go um, get that perfect book. Um, but I'd say the frequency of what I was reading actually really came from the Denver Public Library system. In high school, though, uh, the fourth story was my favorite restaurant in Denver. Yeah. And that was, <laughs> for, for those who are unaware, that was at the top of the Cherry Creek location at the Tattered Cover. And it was one of the uh, nicer restaurants in Denver at the time. Denver's restaurant scene has exploded since then, but it was a, it was a truly awesome place. Yeah. So, all right. So during fast forwarding quite a bit, um, during the pandemic, um, you and your partner, David, um, so you guys put together um, an investment group and ended up taking over the tattered cover, I think as it was kind of like um, heading towards a bankruptcy. Um, so you guys took over sort of a management tr transition and then it seems like went pretty aggressively into like an expansion plan. And I think it, I think you guys opened like four or five new locations um, during COVID. So my question is, basically like, why did you do that? That's, was COVID just like not stressful enough or what was going on? You know, I, to me, th there are two major reasons why the tattered cover opportunity was, was so exciting. Uh, the first is, you know, a, 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 as a black male, I see very clearly that the differences in successful and unsuccessful outcomes, particularly for people of color, really comes down to access to literature. And mm. You know, as I said before, I was extremely blessed and that that was never something I had to worry about. I was always surrounded by books. I had parents who were pushing me to read all the time. And so by the time that I was a thinking person, um, there was just a familiarity and a comfortability around books, a comfortness around books. Uh, unfortunately, that, that's not the narrative um, for many people of color in Denver and across this country. And so one thing that, that I quickly realized is there was a lot of symbolism and um, uh, hope associated with someone who looks like me running an institution like that. And, and, and I thought that, you know, we, we were dealing with a lot of sort of racial issues, particularly in 2020 when we did the acquisition. Yeah. This was a sign that I, I thought in many ways was bigger than me and could have really positive effects um, throughout sort of Colorado, to be honest with you. And the second thing was that, you know, you know, for those who are familiar with the Tattered Cover, you know this, but for, for those who haven't been in, you know, the, the Tattered Cover is your classic independent bookstore. It, 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 it's got, you know, literally across our stores, hundreds of thousands of books. It's got a staff that can get anyone excited about reading. And it's a place that people meet and, and have dialogue and discussion and, and come together. And, and great cities need that. And you, you're right, Dana, Tedder Cover was close to bankruptcy. Um, it, was, it was not in a good place before the pandemic and the pandemic obviously was forgiving to all retail. And so the notion of Denver, the, my, my city not having this iconic institution, it just wasn't, it wasn't possible 
for me to actually envision that. And so I think those two things really fueled the notion of trying to save the business. And, and as you noted, you know, I'm not independently super wealthy. Um, and so I couldn't just put my own financial capital behind it. But what we found is that there were people who did have means who felt similarly about the tattered cover, that, that Denver and Colorado needed the tattered cover and tattered cover needed to be in Colorado. And so we were able to put some capital together to really fund the operation during COVID in which you know, businesses uh, near and far were, were, were losing capital. W with the growth thing, you know, it, it, it's really interesting, right? Because our, our vision for tattered cover, you know, the, the, the statement I always make is there are two things, right? What do you do and, and who are you, right? And so what we do, we sell books. I think it's a pretty easy answer. Sure. But the who are we? I think we're a community institution. And the power of books is that there's no better way to bring people together, to have honest, open dialogue, to listen and entertain and discuss views that are different than your own, to be around diverse, eclectic people. Books are the power to do that. And so we really felt we wanted to take on this notion of being a community institution. And part of that is through growth. You know, the way that Tattered Cover used to operate was you had these giant 20,000, 25,000 yeah. square foot stores that everyone went to. But transportation's changed and the way that people think about retail has changed. And so our thought process was why not go into different communities? Right. Let's not ask people to come to us. Let's go into different parts of the state that, that we think that you know, they would welcome an independent bookstore. And that really fueled our growth. And, and we've done that. We, we literally opened five stores in, about, uh, in less than two years, which it's one of those things where when I say it, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And it's not until... You, know, you actually go back and you're like, oh, we opened that store, we opened that store. Yeah. And, and, and we've done all that and, and it's been amazing because every community deserves a strong independent bookstore and, and we're, we're hoping to deliver that. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. I mean, there's an independent bookstore that I went to growing up in high school, particularly that had a huge impact on me and was like kind of the place where I bought the books that like, you know, expanded my worldview and had like really deep um, like a really deep impact on my life, maybe even like change the course of my life. Um, so I can empathize with that quite a lot. Um, I want to ask you a little bit more about expansion, but because you touched on it, I know you guys had um, this initiative around, I think it's called the, I don't know if it's pronounced like the human experience or is it the human experience? Um, but could, do you mind just talking about that a little bit and like kind of the, the background and like kind of where it's at today? Sure. So, so human um, was a bookstore in okay. Denver. And it was started in 1984 by Clara Villarosa. And she, um, African-American female, and she moved from Lakewood to Denver and she wanted to start a bookstore. And, and her goal was to start a bookstore that just focused on black, black authors, black subjects, and sort of the black narrative. And it's really interesting because Joyce Meskis who made Tattered Cover what it, what it is, she, she was around for 40 years, she and Clara were extremely close. And one of the things that Joyce did, which it, it's funny how history can view these things differently, is Joyce didn't invest as much as she could have with black authors and, and, and black literature because she wanted to ensure that Clara got business. And so Clara ran the store for 16 years. She closed in 2000. She moved to New York City and she reopened a, a human in 2007 that opened for a few years. This all comes back to one of the, the one of the still reasons why we, we wanted to take the business over was because we thought there was an opportunity to, uh, to encourage and help facilitate reading, particularly in communities of color. And, I reached out to Clara, who is 91 years old, and you would think she was, I don't know, 55. Yeah. She spoke with her, interacted with her. And I said, you know, I, I want to bring back human. And, and I want to think creatively with you about how we do that, because it was such a staple 
in the Denver community. I remember my parents would always send out black Santa cards. So you'd know you were getting a holiday card from the Spearman yeah. if it was a black Santa. And we would get those from the Human Bookstore. And so what we came to an agreement on is that Tattered Cover wanted to become a center of excellence for Black authors, for Black narrative, <clears throat> and for Black subjects. And that's the Human Initiative. And so what happens is sort of twofold. One, um, Clara and her family pick um, authors every month under a theme that allows them to highlight new and old authors, right? And, and so we're consistently sort of trying to underscore and bring light on these very, very fascinating stories and, and give some nuance as to what was going on. And then we then use both our, our website, our uh, email marketing and our stores to then put those books on our shelves to put them in front of our customers. And it's, so each store has a human section and, and it's a really cool thing. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a hat tip to what Clara did um, and, and and our goal is to really preserve her legacy because she was such a positive influence on Denver. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit and start, so, sort of touch on some of your past experiences. Um, Cause even though Tattered Cover is the first, you know, the first bookstore that you're running, it's not your first experience sort of like expanding businesses that have a physical presence. Um, and, you know, you spent quite a few years at Be Good and then No Tell. And side note, I love Be Good. I used to eat there all the time when I went when I went so to awesome. school in Boston. Yeah, it was so great. And you could you could really feel like the values and sort of like the mission driven, you know, sort of like aspect of the business as soon as you walked in. Um, so anyway, that's a different story. But um, what could you compare those experiences a little bit? Like the your experience expanding those different businesses to tattered cover. Were there a lot of lessons that you learned there that you brought over, or things that were just like totally different? What was that like? Totally, and I, I want to wrap the be good. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. Um, so be, be good is is slightly, or be good is more similar to tattered cover than I'd say no tell was. Yeah. Um, because you're dealing with brick and mortar um, uh, teams and, and whatnot, sort of the similar. Uh, the, there are a lot of similarities with that. I, I think the biggest thing that you learn with growth is that you have to consistently focus on keeping the culture that has allowed you to grow during a growth stage. Because what mm -hmm. you typically have is, you know, you'll have one or two locations and those locations will be perfectly curated. Those locations will have the, you know, founder and sort of all the key members of the team. They'll basically work out of those locations. So you mm -hmm. could be, you know, a bookseller or a cashier on day three, and I already would know your name because we're in those locations. And when you scale and grow, that goes away, right? Where suddenly it becomes a situation where when you have eight stores, I may not be in one of our stores for two, three, hopefully not four, but it's possible weeks. And, and how do you maintain what it is to work at Tattered Cover? How do you maintain what it is to be at Be Good? Quite frankly, I learned a lot from Be Good's failures on that point. Um, we did not do a very good job of, uh, of, of helping our new stores hmm. understand the magic of yeah. the old stores. And to me, that that's where it really goes back, right? You've got to understand who you are. And you have to be unapologetically stubborn as to who you are and, and what you're doing during growth because suddenly you don't have someone like me there every day to make decisions that reinforce that, right? And so you've got to have a guiding mission and a guiding vision that when people who are at the stores are making decisions, they know that they're making those decisions with the vision. And, and the hope is that the choices they make fall in line with that. I'll, I'll give you a really, really good example. So we just opened in Colorado Springs mm -hmm. and, um, there's a mezzanine uh, in, in that space. It's a beautiful mezzanine, right? And the mezzanine is ADA compliant only because it's a small enough space, but it doesn't have access other than the stairs, the space, right? And so part of the 
development that even I've made at Tattered Cover over the you know two years that I've been here is when we signed the lease on that space, I thought the mezzanine was the coolest thing on the planet, right? It's beautiful. You look yeah. down on the store, great shots, et cetera. But you know, we've been talking internally about accessibility. And we we did you know a lot of work on DEI and, and I think we've transformed our business around that. And the next conversation was, well, let's talk about accessibility. We have leadership members on our team who have, you know, let's say MS, for example, and accessibility is an issue for them. And it became incredibly clear that we could not be a community institution and have a mezzanine in one of our floors that wasn't accessible to everybody, yeah. right? And so when we opened the store, we didn't open the second floor because we're like, we don't know how to use this space and we can't be a community institution if not everyone from the community has equal access to tattered cover. And, and those are the things that allow you to grow, right? Because okay. you know, typically when you're growing, the business model more or less works and there's market demand, but where things fall apart is you lose that like je ne sais quoi of what made the company yeah. special. And, and so it was a really cool process and we owned it. You know, and, and now on that space, you know, people can lounge, but there are no books up there. There's no content up there. And there's nothing that you couldn't get on the, on the first floor of the space. And it's going to stay that way because, once again, we can't be a community institution and have parts of our store that aren't accessible to all of our community. Yeah. Do you think that those lessons apply to an even broader context? So even if you're not running um, a brick and mortar store, but you're running you know, a startup or a software company, do you think that you can take those same lessons and kind of apply them through growth periods? Because I think that's that's been more of my experience and probably the experience of people listening to this is like, you know, being in, in like high growth software companies where things, there's like breaking points, like 40 people, 100 people, um, things always get a little crazy. Totally. I mean, Notel was interesting, right? Because, you know, our we were a smaller WeWork. So everything you hear yep. when, when, when you watch the WeWork, um, show we were doing all that but maybe at a tenth of the size and it's it's the exact same point it's that you hit a point in which the founder the ceo key leadership they can't always be in the room and their skill set changes right and this is why i think when you hit those points 40 employees 100 employees 500 employees etc a lot of times you aggressively need different leaders. Because yeah. at 40 employees, a CEO can look at themselves and say, I myself <laughs> can push this company up a mountain, right? Yep. I can sit in on all the various departments, like we're all sort of utility players. At 100, you kind of need the vision, but you can still sort of feel like you're there. 500, you're not going to know the 495th employee in your organization. And suddenly your skill set can't be that you are the one getting things done. You cannot superman the process to get yourself over. You have to empower people yeah. to get you up the mountain, right? And so in many ways, and, and, and I need to think of a better way to describe it, but it's sort of like that situation where you're being carried by your team and, and you kind of just need to be sort of sitting there just like, this is totally cool. And if you can't do that, you will not scale effectively. Right. If people are the, the worst thing that can happen is sort of your deputy's deputy is reliant on you to make a decision. Right. When instead yeah. you've got to look at what the mission of the business is. And, and that's where you see, you know, the companies that can do it at the rate that they do it. You know, if you think about what Facebook was what was doing for social media, right? And, and this 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 network effect that they knew that they were creating in our society, that was a unifying belief. When you look at Google and the ability of search and sort of unlocking the internet, those are things that if you, simple points, but if everyone in your organization understands it, it allows you to continue to grow and do great things. And if you don't have it, scaling is not going to work out well for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a point when, um, when leaders or founders in particular kind of have to transition from becoming from chief operators to chief, you're then the chief storyteller, the chief recruiter, um, the chief visionary, um, and the chief operator on top of it. <laughs> um, things yeah. just get, yeah. And it's, it's really hard, 
it's really hard because because you go from a stage of you're in the weeds and you're collaborating and you're guiding to overnight you're micromanaging <clears throat> and you're not letting people <clears throat> breathe and you're not letting people grow and it's an incredibly hard process because you have to get comfortable with the fact that people your best uh, employees are only going to agree with you 80 percent of the time and so you know one out of five times you're going to see them making a decision from afar that you don't agree with but you've got to trust that the other four decisions that they're making are ones that you are wholeheartedly behind and if that's the yeah. case y- you let them fly right and it's just it's such a mental ch- you know uh, change I- I'm not it, you know, where I sort of fit on it is, is I think I, I don't think I could be employee number one or like one through yeah, 40 sure. where, where I sort of find myself is like, you've got these businesses that need disruption. They need that sort of first level of major growth, you know, from be good to from like nine stores to like 70, um, you know, tell we opened up like 11 markets, 10 recovery, we've already opened up five stores and, and where I'm, you know, thinking from a leadership perspective, my growth area now is, can I run that bigger organization? Where to your point, it's about chief storytelling, it's about getting the best talent in and about ensuring that the business has finances to continue to grow. And that's it, Yeah. <laughs> right? It's, it's not coming in and being like, why is this book not face out? <laughs> that's not my job anymore, yeah. right? And, and that's, it's, it's hard. It's very, yeah. very hard. Yeah. Um, so switching gears a little bit, this, this is a big question, but what do you think the future, or let me back up a little bit. Retail's gotten kind of crushed the past 10 years, maybe the past couple of years in particular with the pandemic. Um, bookstores are sort of a, become a symbol of that, right? Because Amazon started as an on, online bookstore borders going out of business was pretty high profile. Um, so what do you see as, as the future of retail broadly? And then, you know, specifically with bookstores, what do you see as the future? I think retail organizations that don't have an experiential curative element of their business Mm -hmm. won't exist, right? I I think that we have all seen how simple delivery can be. Um, And, you know, just me going to pick up socks at Target, uh, that's not smart anymore right i mean it's not i'm out of groceries and and every time i go to the grocery store i'm like why am i doing this i should just be able to get this delivered to me and i think you know targets realize this i think they view their stores as warehouses more necessarily than retail venues so i think you've got to give people a distinguishing reason to go in your doors that being said i think that's going to be a tailwind, right? Where we are very isolated right now. We, we are extremely isolated. Even, you know, this conversation, normally we'd need to be, you know, pre-pandemic, we probably, I mean, 50% likelihood we'd be in the same room yeah. doing this type of a conversation. And now it's, it's totally foreign to us that we would do that. So we, we are way more isolated than we were three years ago. And, and I think the boomerang, I don't know if it will, go as far back as like, oh, we're in 2018, but it will go back where people are searching for gathering places. And so I think if you can create an experience in which people want to be together and and receive actual benefit from being together, right? Coupled with a mission that people believe in, I think people will go to that. Now, the question is, is like, is that something retail businesses are really good at doing, right? For the past 200 years, that hasn't necessarily been their forte, right? It's been like, you need boxers or socks or whatever, Mm -hmm. and we have them and you come and pick them up. Where I think bookstores have a a sneaky competitive advantage is, you know, ever since Amazon came on, we've only won the experiential war, right? The the fact of walking into one of our stores and the smell of books or having exceptional customer service or Mm -hmm. feeling lost in sort of a beautiful maze of literature, that's why people have been going to us for the past 20 years. 
And so I actually think we are better situated to come out of the pandemic and to have, to give, to provide our customers a reason to come back. Um, But make, make no mistake, you know, two things are in for a very difficult period. One retail generally, but second is local businesses. The thing I always want to remind people, and I understand it's an incredibly sensitive topic for me, no one is saying stop all of your Amazon purchases. No one's saying that. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's unrealistic. But local businesses are a decision that is made by the community every day. And so if you want a local economy, and I believe that local businesses are like the bees of our ecosystem, you really don't know how much you're going to lose until they're not there anymore. Right. Yep. But if you want local businesses, you got to support local businesses. Right. Yeah. And, and, and once again, I'm not saying every single purchase has to do it, but you've got to support local businesses. And, and we need to, in turn, create reasons for you to do that. And, and if we can do that, I think there's a path to survival. But re- retails, I mean, it, you'd be lying if you're like, oh, I think everything is going to be great for retail. The, the other major issue with retail is how we think about labor. Right. Where. Unfortunately, you've got cities like Denver that have become so expensive to live in. Mm. We can't cover a wage that's a living wage. You know, to me, the definition of a living wage is can you live and work proximate to each other, right? You don't have to have the biggest house or apartment yeah. or whatever, but can you, can you physically get to where you need to go to with ease? And, and a lot of cities like Denver, that answer is increasingly no. And so... We also have to think about sort of what city investments and what state investments and federal investments we're going to make to ensure our workers have the opportunity to live and to have productive lives working in retail. And if we don't do that, it's going to be a very tough putt for us. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, I think on the, the experiential front, just to drill down on that a little bit, I think bookstores do have kind of an advantage, right? Because as you mentioned, the smell of books, such a, it's such a strong thing. It just like immediately brings people, it just touches on something deeper. Um, But it's a place you can go grab a coffee or a hot chocolate. You've got the smell. And also I think that there's so much work to be done with like discovery, just like the concept of discovery. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that like Airbnb is doing well is because it's easier to discover trips and ideas on there than it is on, maybe like Marriott.com. Um, totally. And you're even that. seeing like, you're seeing people search for things on TikTok instead of Google news. And you're a lot of times people search for things on Pinterest instead of Google photos. So I think that there's a lot of room for dispersion just in the area of discovery. And with, with books in particular, there, there's so much literature out there, so much good literature and, and it's, and there's always more coming out. Amazon, I mean, Amazon's pretty terrible at discovery anyway. It's good if you if you want to buy a phone charger or something that's more of a commodity. But if you want to read the back of a book or you want to flip open the first couple of pages, you cannot you can't do that on Amazon. I mean, it's horrible. Um, so I think that bookstores, you know, compared to other type of retail businesses, maybe do have an advantage there, which which is good. Um, I, I I totally agree with that. It, you know, to, to me, it's experiential plus curation, which I think is mm. um, a synonym for discovery for for what you just sort of said. And I think that needs to be umbrellaed with a mission. And if you yeah. can do those three things, I think you can offer something to your customer um, that makes them want to not engage in delivery. Um, it's interesting. I have a friend who's thinking through, mm-hmm. you know, so for example, uh, spirits, right? Because similarly, it's like, why do you ever need to go to a liquor store, right? Well, yeah think about how wine stores do a very good job of like they're doing tasting they've got sommeliers and yep. you know there, there, there are 10 15 dollar pinot noirs you know two are good eight are bad right like and, and and that's the type of experience that makes you go to a wine store right and, and so i think there's a huge opportunity and you're 100 percent right there's so many books out there that understand that perfect book for you, which by the way, is the biggest barrier to getting people excited about reading. It is the biggest barrier is that we, we have a sort of canical view of the type of books that one should be reading. 
And if you don't read those books, then you don't consider yourself a reader. And, and what's so beautiful about independent bookstores is we disavow that. And, and mm. our booksellers, you go to a tattered cover and you walk up to a bookseller and you say, I, you know, I don't even know what I'm looking for. They'll just start yeah. asking questions. What do you enjoy doing? You know, what was your last favorite trip? And they will start weaving recommendations for you. And, and suddenly you'll start reading and you'll love it. And then it just takes someone saying, see that thing that you're doing? Yeah, you're a reader. And it yeah. just opens up a new world for you. There's also pressure to finish books. Um, I forget where, I may have heard it from Naval or somebody on a podcast years ago, but it was like, if you're not enjoying a book, just close it. You're, you don't have to finish every book you start. You're not, a, right. you know, you're not a fraud. You're like, it's okay. Um, I've started doing that more and more. I, if any book looks a little bit interesting to me, I go to the tattered cover on Colfax because I, I live a few blocks away. Anything that looks interesting, I just buy it. And if yeah. I, I finish maybe 25% of them, but um, yeah. So do you think like, so I think that that makes sense in terms of a recipe to get people in the door and to get people coming back but from a business perspective. Is there a certain scale that you think that, so my fear is that there's this sort of awkward middle ground where you're, if you're a specialty shop, there's going to be a lane for you. If you're super mainstream, um, there's a lane for you, but you're kind of a mile wide and an inch deep. What do you think is kind of like the right blend for a business like the tattered cover? Is there a certain scale where you guys start to get economies of scale? Is there a certain blend of, um, in person, in person versus e-commerce is growing the physical footprint, a way to grow the brand, which then drives e-commerce. Like, like, what, do you know what that strategy is? Or are you guys still trying to figure that out? No, I listen, I, I think you are wise beyond your years, Dana, because oh, thanks, I, I, I totally, no, I, to, I totally agree. And it, honestly, it, it was the biggest problem that we saw with the tattered cover in 2020. And it was the reason why I was losing so much money. Yeah. You, you have to make a decision um, with, you, with retail businesses. You either have one and most likely you have one person who's the boss and that person is your CEO your HR leader, your CFO, your chief strategist, that person knows the entire staff, that person knows customers because that person's in the store every day. And, and that's a model where you can spit out a margin that mm -hmm. basically just pays for that person's salary and then mm -hmm. everyone else's and you're fine, right? Or you need to have enough contribution margin from your stores to pay for your admin, mm. right? And where tattered cover was is when you have like four stores, you need an operations leader, you need a CFO, you likely need an HR person, right? You need something going on with your marketing and you need someone to lead all of those functions plus the store managers, mm -hmm. right? That's, that, that's kind of expensive, right? Yep. And, and what you'll find is that you can, that nucleus can probably monitor, I'd say five to 12 stores, right? Got it. Yep. And, and, and that's kind of where we're driving towards. So to me, and it, maybe it's just because it's like an incredibly simple number, but um, you know, 10 <laughs> is, is, is where you can start saying we can pay for our admin. Yep. And, you know, one of the decisions you make, right, is like, you know, how much contribution you need from your stores, but you know, if, if, if you can pay for your admin and there's profit at the end of the day that you can put into a cash reserves, that's a good way to do it. And, and so I don't have the exact formula for how many units um, a business should have, but you've, you've totally nailed it where you don't want to be in that gray zone yeah. where you don't have the margin from your stores to support a healthy administrative team. And subsequently, subsequently what happens is quality of service drops at your four or five locations and you bleed out cash. All right. I want to, I want to end with a couple of rapid fire questions and then I think we can okay. wrap up. Um, sure. You can answer them. You can go rapid or you can expand on them as much as you want. Um, all right. So who is a favorite author that has been to the tattered cover since you took over? That's a great question. So Callie Fajardo and Steen is a local author. She wrote Sabrina and Karina. Okay. And she is just such an up and coming rock star. Um, and she, her, uh, Sabrina and Karina, I believe, was a National Book Award finalist in like 2019. And she's our age. She just has such a bright, 
future ahead of her. Yeah, amazing. Um, what is your favorite bookstore in the world other than Tattered Cover? Other than Tattered Cover? I, I would say Politics and Prose in DC. Um, I, I think they do a really good job of feeding into what it is to be in our nation's capital um, with the type of events they do. I mean, every politician has done an event at Politics and Prose. Um, and they do an incredibly good job, at least in my opinion, of having more difficult conversations on the political spectrum among different types of people. And they do that through literature. Um, what's one book, one book recommendation from the past one or two years can't be a business book, which I get the sense you don't read a lot of business books anyway. Well, I was, I, it's, it's so funny because the book that I was going to say is The Man Who Broke Capitalism. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I, I just think so, so. So it's it's David Gell's, and the reason why it's such a good book, um, Dana, is Jack Welch. So, so the book is about Jack Welch, and yeah, it's, it's, oh, yeah, I know the background of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I'm fascinated by it. To be super yeah. honest with you, and the the, the premise is Jack Welch. Defi- Jack Welch, excuse me, defined business success in the '80s, and mm-hmm. there, what his business success essentially did was the the basis of corporate greed. And, and what the author, David Gels, is, is, is arguing is that before Jack Welch was um, so prominent, it, CEOs viewed themselves as being outstanding members of the community. So they would brag about how much taxes they would pay and you know providing housing for their employees. You can go back to the Midwest with, you know, when the automotive industry was doing everything. And if you worked for GM, in addition to just having a day-to-day job, you had a house, a two, three bedroom yeah. house and a car. And, and Jack Welch changed all that. This is, this is the theory. I'm not, this is why it's a fascinating book for me. Um, I'm also reading a book on Josip uh, Tito, just because okay. I think that his form of like, being a benevolent dictator is just fascinating to mm. me, given sort of what's happening with Putin right now. Um, and, and and there there are a few really cool biographies on him, but I, I don't know. I think the Wall Street book is awesome. Yeah, definitely. It's like, yeah, Jeffrey Immel got kind of a bad rap when we look back on things. Um, yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of those, there's a lot of um, Jack Welsh acolytes still running around. I mean, I think they maybe just recently closed it, but there was like a Jack Welch business school. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Okay, last question for you. Um, What's one piece of advice about, one piece of advice you give to people running businesses about how to stay sane with everything going on in the markets, in the world, business related, not business related? Um, What's your best advice? Yeah, it's a really good question. and I say, uh, I need to think of it better because because mental health, not in the sense of um, um, uh, problems, but but mental sanity is one of the most important characteristics of a leader. You, you've mm, got to yeah. remember, as a leader, if you are nervous, if you are expressing doubt, if you are angry, if you scream, everyone in your organization will follow suit. Yep. And... You have to be level-headed and cool, and every piece of news, whether it's the best thing that happened or the worst thing that happened, you have a very calm, uh, thoughtful approach to. And doing that requires a lot (laughs) of internal calmness. And so I think one of the things that gets a bad rap, and this is where, you know, uh, I don't want to get into the sort of like, CEO sort of like work hard debate, but you yeah. have got to de-stress yourself. You've got to yep. de-stress yourself. Yeah. And if there are productive ways that you can de-stress, you need to put those into your daily, not weekly, but daily routine. The other thing I'll say is never, you're fighting a war, not a battle. And so wearing yourself down is always the wrong answer because that will lead to these outbursts and this uh, the, the emotion that prevents you from being successful. Cool. Well, Kwame, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you saving the tattered cover. Um, Thank you. And yeah, I'll see you soon. All right. Thanks. All right. See ya. 
Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Top Out. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see the next episode, please follow our page on LinkedIn or subscribe to our YouTube. We'll see you next time.